Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, you know, you guys, there's so many people here. You know, I'm not giving you anything away tonight. Right? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Secrets. Secrets. Uh, Secrets. Um, before we get started, I'd like to introduce a friend of mine, Kate Anderson. Um, Kate just finished writing the book on the Westboro State Hospital. A spectacular book. Um, so in the back. Because of you. Oh. It's only spectacular because of him. <laughs> um, Kate was spent quite a bit of time going through a lot of the, the photographs I have. Um, and the blog ended up in the book. So if you have an interest in the state hospital, um, and I think usually almost everybody in town has some sort of connection. He, either there was a relative or an aunt or an uncle that worked there. I know my mother worked there for a short period of time. My aunt worked there for a short period of time. Uh, when I worked uh, in town for the fire department, of course, we were in there all, all the time. <laughs> so, um, you want to talk just a little bit about your book, Kate? Um, sure. Uh, so, like Phil said, I put together an Images of America book. It is the chronological history of the State Hospital from its time as the Lyman Reform School all the way to its present, now demolished state. Um, a good deal of images came from Phil's collection and the rest of the images came from Tony at the Westboro Library. Um, and it was an incredible experience to put that together because Westboro State Hospital is very unique in very many ways. It was the first of its kind in Massachusetts in very many ways as well. I'm not going to tell you what they are because you have to buy the book to find out. <laughs> I can't give away all of my trade secrets. Um, but I do have copies of the book tonight if you're interested. Um, I'll be hiding in my corner at the back. Um, and she'll even sign them. I will. Mm -hmm. I will. Although I hear that devalues them. It's harder to sell them on eBay. <laughs> um, and I will say, it was. I was so impressed with what Kate did. Um, she gave me the, uh, the little push to start on my book. And my book on Westboro will be out um, approximately August of next year. Uh, same size, same type of format. Um, it'll be close to uh, about 180 photographs of vintage Westboro. So uh, you'll see, actually, you'll see a few tonight. But just like Kate, I'm not going to give away all my secrets before. Kate. So thanks, Kate. And. Um, great to see you all tonight. Uh, obviously you love Westboro history and love Westboro as it was and we're going to see bygone days of Westboro. I'm Chris Allen from the Historical Society which is putting this on tonight and we're delighted to have historian Phil Kittredge and his famous collection with us. Since he was in Westboro High School Phil has collected town memorabilia, from Civil War swords to hat forms, but most of all, vintage photographic postcards and glass negatives. Phil joined the Westboro Fire Department in 1971, and he served for 42 years, retiring as captain in 2013. He and his wife, Donna, have been associated with the Westboro Food Pantry since 1999 and for the last six years have run it uh, and directed all the uh, amazing work the Food Pantry does. Over time, Phil has collected 6,000 photographic postcards of Westboro and 400 vintage glass negatives. He commented that Westboro was very fortunate because between 1880 and 1910, there were four professional photographers in town. Phil has added to his collection through uh, estate sales, <coughs> flea markets, and all different ways, particularly when the Circle Store closed and the Westboro News closed. Phil was able to buy up their entire inventory. He has painstakingly cleaned, restored, polished, and digitized all the photographs that he has been able to collect that are postcards and vintage photographs. 
So we're very lucky to have Phil in our community collecting all of this wonderful record of Westboro long ago. And I welcome Phil Hitchens. Oh, shucks. <laughs> um, it's true, I have uh, started collecting Westboro when I was in high school um, because of one person primarily, and that was Don Lowe. I don't know if any of you remember Don Lowe from the Lowe's Variety family. Uh, Donald wrote a uh, local history column in the newspaper, and I was always interested in local history. And then, of course, became friends with Charlotte Spinney. And Charlotte, you know, would always give you a little push <laughs> along the way. And this has been my hobby. You need to speak a little louder, I think, um, if you can't, oh, first thing, the most important thing, the restrooms, <laughs> I've already been asked about four times, out that door and to your left, and then the bathrooms will be on your right, and there's a men's and a ladies' room. All right? So, and, if, and I won't be offended if you get up and run out the door, because I'll know where you're going and I'll tell everybody else what you're doing. <laughs> um, again, Don Lowe got me started, and that was, that was the beginning. Um, you know, as, as Chris said, we had a lot of photographers in Westboro. And not only did we have photographers, we had stores that sold photography kits so the person that lived in town could take this home, take pictures with their Kodak, as it was called, and then bring the, the glass negatives of the film back to the store, and they would make them into postcards for you. So you, you see a lot of the postcards, the photo postcards, of Westboro are really of specific incidents. Um, and what's nice about those, they capture that exact moment and day in history, whether it was a fire, whether it was a parade, um, a train wreck. It's, they're really kind of neat. They're different than your, your standard. So before we get going, um, can everybody hear me now? If you can't, just yell louder and I'll speak. All right. So I put this program together for the Historical Society because they've uh, they've been very generous to me in the past, and you know, and, and I, I always put on a show for them at least once a year. I also do so many shows down at the the Senior Center. So if you can't catch it here, or you miss a show here sometimes because they do they do fill up, I do usually do it one other place in the course of the year. So all right, let's start. So. This is a different type of program where we're going to cover about 100 years of uh, pictures of Westboro and images. So before photography, this is what was used to be in the newspapers. You'd see um, you know, etchings, line drawings. Um, this is what the state reform school looked like in 1848. That's Lake Chauncey. The state reform school was the first juvenile detention center in the country in uh, built in Westboro. And they built it up along Lake Chauncey for a couple of reasons. One, because at that time in the 1840s, the main thoroughfare for Westboro wasn't the center of town, it was Route 9. That's where we had all the taverns, that's where, we had, that's where the original stores were, you know, Willow, Willow Park, uh, Powder Hill, that whole area up there. So they had it up there because they could bring the boys in from Boston and Cambridge and Somerville, and they kept them away from the uh, the decent folk in downtown Westboro, <laughs> and that's what they that's specifically why they put the facility up there. The uh, prison yard. This is again about 1870. This is at the original State Reform School. That's the building in the background. Um, Ninety percent of these boys were not convicted of any crime. They were either homeless or truant from school or um, some of them were abandoned by their families. Uh, family couldn't support them. They lived on the streets. So the population really um, kind of sad that this is where they'd have to end up. But that's, that's what happened back then. So when they, remember, when they first opened it, they built a school that could hold 300 people. Within two years, it was at capacity. 
So they had to put an addition on in 1852. In 1852, they started housing um, not just troubled boys, but now they started housing criminals. Um, boys that had attacked, robbed, knifed, stabbed. Um, and you'll notice for the first time, where before everything was open dormitories, now they have individual cells. And that's where the, the vicious boys went, the ones that caused all the trouble. So the buildings grew, additional buildings were built. One of the interesting things that we found out about the state reform school in the last uh, few months, we found out that there, just despite all the stories you've heard about a crematorium at Westboro State Hospital, and everybody's heard that, you've probably seen some of the videos online, that's an incinerator, there's never a crematorium, all the patients were always buried down at Pine Grove. There was a cemetery for the state reform school. Um, the only documentation we have was it was on the shores of Lake Chauncey, and that the, the, the description was the sun would reflect on it in the late afternoon. So we, and it was approximately a thousand feet west of that main building you saw in that picture. So it places it um, towards the uh, Worcester side of the building, if you look at the main building, probably in the area where the sewer beds were when they had their own sewer treatment plant down there along the hospital. There's no trace of it now. There's no record of any of the bodies being removed and brought to a different location. Um, it's something that a couple of people have um, expressed interest in, in exploring further and find out what really happened. It's not on the property that the town owns and it's not on the property that Pulte is building. It's on the property that the state still owns. So the town's not going to have to deal with that issue, luckily. So, this is what downtown looked like. Um, to your left, and hopefully nobody minds the, the point of it. Something. This is South Street. This is West Main. This is the, the store right at the corner. You know, right down there now, the package store is in here and over here. The neon sign is over there. So this is the building that was there before. Um, the Eagle Block and the Central Block, these two, two buildings here, um, they were built in 1855 and in 1870 they, rem they were remodeled. And if you look at how great the buildings looked in this picture, I would suspect this is probably very shortly after they were remodeled. Um, one of the things you have to remember, if you watch a, an old Western movie and you like Western movies at Gunsmoke and you saw the old towns in the West, Everything is dirt. Um, they had some wooden sidewalks. There were some wooden sidewalks at Westboro. The, at least the areas where the, uh, the horses went up and down protected the people if they were walk, walking near the building. They weren't going to get run over by a horse in a wagon. Uh, but this is really what Westboro looked like. It was all dirt. And upstairs, you see right here, that's the uh, Westboro Savings Bank, huh. its first location. I talked about photographers. Here's a building that was specifically <coughs> built for photographers. You'll notice up here, you got all these windows, and up top, this glass skylight. Because photography is still very early at this point. You know, um, we're, we're talking 1850s, 1860s. Hadn't been around that long. The quality. Although good, it wasn't as great as it, as it would become. Um, you needed a lot of exposure time. So that's why you see in a lot of the pictures of people standing, they're not smiling. There's a reason for that. <laughs> they can hold a straight face for much longer time than you know, a big smile on their face. <laughs> so you'll see, you'll see that. So this aren't <coughs> residences upstairs. Pardon me? They're not residences upstairs. Some of them had residences, like this, the building here. These, had, these were residences upstairs, but all your photographers had photo studios upstairs. The arcade building down the center of town, if you remember when they redid the front of the building, they also did 
some repairs on the side of the building, behind the pizza parlor, on the top floor. That whole area in there, when that building was built, was all glass. It was almost 15 feet across, and the roof was all glass. That was another photo studio. So the buildings had a specific reason. The, um, these buildings, even though they were remodeled in 1870, they, they lasted three years. And then they were burnt down by an arsonist. Uh, Antonio Joan, who was a, a blacksmith that lived in one of the apartments, had some sort of a beef. And he lit a fire, and it burned all the buildings down. It also destroyed this small little building here, which was the uh, Protective Union store. So we lost all of those beautiful buildings. The National Straw Works. Uh, East Main Street, um, right about where um, the community house is and the borough project. Mm -hmm. Their buildings ran all the way to the Keating building, that big brick building that's in now, and all the way up to the center of town and back, oh, probably about 1,000, 1,500 feet. There were about 18 to 20 different buildings in this whole complex. Um, they started in 1869, and in 10 years later, they had over 2,000 full-time employees working here. Um, Westboro was a very prosperous town back then. Um, the uh, factory ended up becoming the largest hat shop maker in the country, and some people say the world, but um, their products were shipped all over the country. Now you'll notice a little difference in the quality of the pictures. These, are, these images are from 1885 to 1905. These are from the glass negatives that you heard Chris talk about. Glass negatives look just like a regular pane of glass, but if you remember, people had 35 millimeter cameras when you took a slide, the image was about the size of a postage stamp. Some of the glass negatives are as big as 11 by 14 inches. So these were huge cameras, and they, they took the emulsion, and they <coughs> coated the glass, put it in the camera, put the big, you saw, remember those guys that throw the big hoods, you've seen the pictures that throw the hoods over? That's what they did. And they took the, the glass out, brought it back to their shop, and would develop it. The problem with the glass negatives, once they printed them up, they didn't need the negative anymore. The glass was expensive. So they'd scrape that off again, recode it, take another picture. So there's not a lot of glass negatives still around. Um, we're lucky, I've been able to, and two or three different collections that have come into my hands, including another collection that I got about three months ago of another hundred glass negatives of Westboro that I haven't even started to look at yet. So we'll have, we'll have some more to come. So see the difference of the quality? So here's the railroad station. One of the things that I tried to put in the, in the show is I tried to put in people, because I think people make the difference um, there are a lot of pictures of the train station, but there's not very many pictures of a grumpy old guy sitting on the back. <laughs> um, and he's probably not too happy that somebody's taking his picture. Um, this is the railroad, this was the passenger station, not the freight station. This was the passenger station that, um, where the present station is, is now uh, Waterman Design mm -hmm. and the, the new uh, restaurant, which has been closed for the last year. Um, They're in that area. So the trains arrived in Westboro in the, uh, in the uh, 1839, I think, 1840. They, they came into the center of Westboro and it changed the, whole, uh, changed the whole town with the trains. Just like out in, the, out in the west, when the trains went through a town, the town sprung up, manufacturing came up. That's exactly what happened in Westboro. Westboro was mostly rural and farm area, but even from the 1850s, there was a lot of manufacturing going on in Westville. It was different than some of the other towns that surround us. And because of that, we had all these people, we had to have a place to put them. Now this is the Whitney House. This was a, the equivalent of a five-star hotel today, located right across from the town hall where the present uh, police station is. You'll see the cemetery to the right. Um, Beautiful building, uh, made with Westboro bricks. 
from East Main Street. In the back, you'll see uh, not only was it a, a fancy hotel with a dining area inside, it also had a full service livery, uh, blacksmith shop, stables. They could repair your wagons, they could repair your carts. Everything you needed was good, could all be handled right here. When the trains came into the passenger station, um, now this picture here, the passenger station was still down in the center of town um, next to the 7-Eleven. The, the boys would have little cards and they would, when the train run in, they would grab the guy, grab him by the hand and say, hey, this, this is the place where you need to stay. Even though, even though there was a hotel right across from the station, they'd try to bring them up here and for every one of the, the, um, the guests that the boys ride up here, they got a reward. <laughs> and they would carry the bags up here to the hotel. Um, it was a very expensive building for the time. Uh, Mr. Whitney had built it, owned the uh, large box factory at Westboro, and the, he, one of his, the biggest, most elaborate house in Westboro was the, uh, you probably remember where the high school is, it was well, owned by the Aronson when it was destroyed, Aronson family when it was destroyed by the tornado. Um, that was originally the Whitney Estate. All the land from West Main Street, all the way down to Ruggles Street, and all the way up over the hill, there was no Harvey Lane, none of that. That was all beautifully man manicured property that belonged with his big estate. So he was very wealthy, probably the most wealthy person in town. And this is Probably very early, as you notice that we, we've only got two stores in this view. We've got uh, William Lowe, the druggist on the side, W.C. Lowe, and then we have a grocery store. The other two storefronts still uh, haven't been occupied yet. We don't have any signs up. So we know that this is relatively new. Looks just like that today, right? <laughs> The building on your right, that's the second meeting house. That was a, originally, uh, you know, where people would worship. Um, because of all the tremendous noise of the trains going up and down the, the tracks, the noise of the wagons going by, and the streetcars, they decided that they would move out and sell it. So it was sold to a gentleman and believe it or not, he jacked up the building, put another floor in underneath, took the steeple off, the steeple um, came down, the bells ended up, if you, everybody knows, up at the Baptist church, the old Baptist church, and this became, a, became known as the arcade. These are the buildings that replaced the ones that, got, that were burned down. These, these are still standing today, but this building is gone, the building behind it, where McIntyre Insurance is at the corner of Milk and West Main, that was the car block, the Westbrook Chronotype was in there, there was a furniture st store in there. And then after that, we had the post office block. That building was torn down, and a apartment building, Grace Simleton's style to that, was erected on the same site you know, just a few years ago. This picture was taken from the National Straw Works, <coughs> in one of the towers, looking back up towards the center of town. And you'll notice the little horse trough is still there today. It's on a little island, so you can't run into it, but. But you notice all dirt. And here you can see the little pass where the people would walk. And here we are, we're probably right around 1900, a few years later, because now the railroad tracks stop. They stop right here. They're gone. So that means they've been relocated uh, to their present location. The old passenger station, which is boarded up, is to your left. And behind the, the delivery wagon with the horse is the Westboro Hotel. So the passengers would come in, get off the train, and they could go right over to the hotel. Unless the guy, the little boys grab them first and drive them up. <laughs> um, we have an open-air trolley, which is usually means it's a local trolley um, that uh, took people to the surrounding towns, maybe grafted. But it wasn't one of the ones that you'd, you'd, you'd take for any long distance. Behind that, the most important piece of equipment in town, it's tough to see, 
but that's a horse-drawn uh, water wagon. And there are many pictures of the, the water wagon driving around town trying to keep the dust down. Imagine how dirty it was back then. It's a picture of the post office block. And uh, that's the, the apartment building or the new where the real estate offices and the apartments are up above. <coughs> uh, as you're in the center of town, looking towards the library, it's on your right hand side. The cemetery is right where you see those trees. And you're right. This is um, the Rexall store, Buxton's. And the boys wore the boys were referred to as the Buxton boys, and they wore they wore screamingly bright white coats. And as you can see from this picture here, they're so so bright. The detail is washed away. <coughs> but that's West Main Street. And here's what it looked like inside. Most of the stores are small, as you can see here. The, um, I kind of like this. It's got, you know, we get the cigars on the left, we get the little ice cream tables, and we've got a little small kitties ice cream table and chairs on the right hand side. <laughs> But in the back, all these things back here, postcards. The postcard craze was huge from about 1905 till 1920 or so, 25. Every store sold them, and they sold them as, as um, souvenirs because people collected them. If you look at a lot of the postcards, you can see that, I know I owe you a postcard. Here's one from Westboro. Thought you might like this view. Again, very hard to find interior views of stores. We have a few, but not very many. The drugstore is right here, which we just saw. Um, this building, uh, George H. Woodman, and that's his delivery cart right to the right-hand side. Every one of the stores would deliver to your house. So if you bought a, uh, if you bought a stove or if you bought a, uh, a baby carriage, um, it would be del delivered uh, because a lot of people didn't have wagons. They may have had horses. Primary way, primarily the way that people got around was bicycles, believe it or not. So it's kind of tough carrying this you know, big wood burning <laughs> stone on the handbag going home. Um, on the right, you'll see a little sign leaning against the telephone pole, and it talks about the Lake Chauncey Theater. And it was the last showing. It's, it's tough to read the sign, but it says, it's the last showing of the Midnight Express. Mm -hmm. I mean, playing that it was a play that they, they did outside. You can see the trolley tracks on your left, and up here this this used to be a school. That's where the uh, Westboro Savings Bank was, and then it became a video. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the cable company Westboro Cable TV is in there now. And the best thing they ever did is they took the video sign off the back, and you can see the the carved granite on the front where it says uh, Westboro Savings Bank. It's kind of neat that it's back. All right. Have you ever seen such a sad bunch of kids in your life? They, uh, there's like no hope in their eyes. It really is. It's, it's kind of sad. Again, a lot of these boys were there not because they did anything wrong. It's because they were unwanted or they um, just couldn't take care of themselves. These are the younger boys. Um, the Lyman School, this is up now where the present Lyman, or the Lyman School, that most of you remember, up off of, uh, up near the DPW. This is, this, the building is up on uh, up that location. It had moved when it became um, apparent that the State Reform School was a failure. They closed it and they moved the boys up to the, the Lyman School, uh, created the new Lyman School. Uh, Mr. Lyman donated a substantial amount of money, and a new, a new theory was brought about where the boys would live in cottages. They'd have a, usually a married couple and a housekeeper, and between 10 and 12 boys, they would live in these, in these buildings as a family unit. And it was thought that they would, they would um, do better, and they did do better, they did very well. And sometimes the boys were only there for a few years. And um, they were either adopted out or a lot of them were 
adopted. The boys worked for different farmers and families in town, and a lot of the families adopted these boys that were in the, uh, in the school. Uh, unfortunately, again, the school got so overcrowded, they had to abandon this type of uh, program that they were doing, and it ended up being a, a horrible reformatory type system with um, hundreds of boys, the older boys picking on the younger ones. It got so bad at, at some point, the state actually bought a ship and moored it in Boston Harbor, and they took the most violent of the boys and put them on the ship so that they were separated from the, uh, from the younger boys, so they wouldn't be uh, influenced. Now the older boys, yeah. same thing. The faces are, uh, nobody's smiling, and again, it could be, Again, it could be again because of the, the photograph itself that they had to keep a, a face, but the eyes again, they look very sad to me. Um, these are the older boys. This is the, the younger boys never got to march in, in the town. It was the older boys that got to uh, to parade around, and here they are right downtown. The, they were in every Fourth of July parade, every Field Day parade. Um, they performed at different events, and these are the boys that got extra privileges and were able to um, get out away from the school. Now the arcade building is on your left, and you'll notice one of the best things, the Boston Confectionery Store. We had two great candy stores in downtown West Road, within 100 feet of each other. The arcade building, again, that was built all with West Road bricks. Most all the buildings downtown were built from bricks that came uh, from uh, way out East Main Street. You remember the great big, you go out East Main Street near Yulman's, you'll see a brick water tower. That's where a lot of these bricks were manufactured, right in there. The Burnside building, everybody thought that that little area here where the hairdresser is, mm -hmm. oh, that was added on. That was a, no, it wasn't. It's was, it been there since the building was built. And. Um, real quick now, we'll find out who's a real town here or not. This building came down and got replaced by what? A and P. There we go. And who was the head meat cutter? George Burns. George Kane in there. Burns. We had two or three in there. You remember those guys in those big white coats? I remember my mother taking me in there, and inside the front door they had that big coffee grinder. Yeah. And you can smell that coffee as you're coming off the sidewalk. So, I'm not as old as this. I remember that. There's a certain smell, that fresh ground coffee. 1888, the town built its first fire station. It cost $14,000. I don't think you could buy a door on this station. Before this, the the fire trucks were housed under the basement of the old town hall and in a shed uh, behind the town hall on West Main Street. You can access it from Central Street. The station has got four doors, and upstairs there were four rooms. That's because there were four independent volunteer fire companies in Westboro back then. Um, it wasn't until a few years later where they all were organized and became the Westboro Fire Department. The Westboro Fire department didn't even exist till a bunch of businessmen. They asked the town to, to set up a fire department. The town refused. Uh, the town was kind of weird back then, to be honest with you. It took, it took people taking the town to court to build a high school in Westboro, believe it or not. They didn't see any need for it. The fire station was, uh, the fire department, a bunch of people that, that owned all the factories. They wrote a letter to the state. The state established an act requiring a fire department to be established in Westboro. It wasn't by the town, it was by 12 businessmen that did it. So here we are, right inside the brand new fire station. Remember I told you there were four companies. These are on the left, um, these are uh, hose companies. First one is a Chauncey Hose Company, which was a very small unit pulled by a couple of men, a little bit of hose. Then you had the William Curtis Hose Company, a little bigger unit with, it's got lights on theirs, and some gold leafing on the side, looks nice. 
Then you had the Jackson Steamer Company, and you know, the big dome. And then on the far end was Rescue Hook and Ladder. And as you would progress through your, through your years, you started on, on, the, on the Young America Bucket Company. And these, these were just kids that had leather fire buckets. And it was kind of a loose, not really organized part of the town, but they were around. Then they'd get onto one company as they get older, they'd move to the next company. The goal was to get onto the Rescue Hook and Ladder, because that's where all the glory was, that's where all the excitement. Um, you know, climbing up the ladders, rescuing people, doing all that, <coughs> not dragging hose down the street and hooking up to hydrants. Which one do you start on, Phil? Um, <laughs> um, okay. Believe it or not, I started on a, the first truck I drove here was a uh, 1956. So, the, uh, talked about the theater in Lake Chauncey. This is the out outdoor theater, and it's tough to read it. On the, on the sign next to the piano player, but it says the New York Vaudeville Company. And you can see the little stage, with a couple of chairs, a little set, and I'm sure he had his, another sign that says, you know, don't shoot the piano player. <laughs> um, but uh, Chauncey Park, as it was called, was built by the trolley companies as a source of revenue, not for a place for people to go to have fun. They built it strictly as a destination so that they would make money taking people from all the surrounding towns up to uh, Lake Chauncey. Uh, it was a huge complex um, by the time they, uh, they got done. The churches would all have their outings up there. They had, you know, large cooking facilities. They had, as you can see, they, they had room to fit hundreds and hundreds of people. And I like the old Coca-Cola bottles on the table. One of the, one of the other things that's really neat, if you look at these pictures from about this time, is how dressed up everybody was. Um, a lot of the ladies, as you can see, they wore hats. The men, even when they were walking down the streets, you'll see them in, in suits. They, nobody was very casual back then. The dance pavilion. In its heyday, over 2,000 people a night um, came to the, uh, the dance pavilion. They were actually, I have a couple of the dance tokens. They would, the men and ladies would actually purchase a token about the size of a silver dollar. It would be good for one dance. Had a picture of the pavilion on it. And everybody would play the dance floor and they'd let so many people on that give their tokens. They would dance for three minutes to the live orchestra. <laughs> Off the floor, the next yeah. room them on. Um, you notice the big brass era car uh, packed outside. Very, very rare. We have very few pictures of automobiles in Westbury at this time. Again, most likely somebody very wealthy, either somebody from town, maybe one of the big business owners, somebody maybe owns the, the owner of the National Straw Works. Um, very uncommon to see those. This picture was identified uh, as the Boy Scouts camping at Lake Chauncey. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. I'm, that's how it was identified. That's how it, it, it was in a, an old folder. The only thing I have a problem with is if you look, these guys look fine. This guy's got a pistol in his hand. Oh. <laughs> um, now, I don't know whether he was protecting the other guys from bears or, or whether it, it's just odd that if it is indeed the Boy Scouts, that he would have a, a gun with him and display it in a photograph. And yet, I love pictures of people. These are these are people uh, who identified as teachers. Now, again, starting from the back, this guy, young man, he's very attentive. The lady's happy. The guy with the big mustache in the middle is having a great time. I think the lady to his side, I think she actually passed away a couple of years earlier. And then you got the gentleman with the big mustache on the right. Now, in the front, this guy in the middle, he's got his eyes on the girl. And she's a little embarrassed because she's looking away, far away. Um, and nobody in this group went to school to learn how to hang a picture straight. <laughs> 
<laughs> Here we get some great pictures of some of the students from Westboro. Um, I love the two guys, the two boys in the very expensive suits up in the back. Those guys look like they have trouble. <laughs> um, and of course the girls outnumbered the boys for many years in Westboro by three and four to one. And part of that was the boys didn't go to school. They, they, if they were on the farms, they stayed and worked on the farms. Um, but again, those two guys back there, I'd, I'd steer clear of them. And obviously, they, again, they had money, so it could have been, you know, they may be uh, some of the Whitney boys, uh, the Bartlett boys. We did have a few very wealthy families in town at the time. And here's where they went to school. This is the Ford School over on Grove Street, where the Eli Whitney School is now. There's uh, the boys went in one door, the girls went in another door, the teachers went in the third. There were separate gymnasiums down in the basement. They, they were kept segregated. And you'll see in the back, the Harvey School is built in the background. This building was demolished in 1906, and they built the uh, the Harvey School. Well, not the Harvey School, the Eli Whitney School, which now houses the Y. Now, everybody know where we are now? We're at the State Hospital. The entrance to the State Hospital. Oh yeah. And it's tough to read the sign, um, but the sign says that you're not allowed to come on the state hospital property on Sundays. They were restricted. So you could go up there during the week, but on Sundays there were no guests and nobody was allowed. One of the th nice things about this picture, it's one of the few pictures that shows the large barns and these little things right here, these white things, those are cows. It's one of the only pictures that shows the they raised cows for beef and they raised cows to produce milk. Um, they also raised pigs. They had um, over 5,000 pigs die in one of the barn fires uh, right around 1907. Remember, a lot of these buildings, some of the buildings in town had electricity. Uh, Westboro was one of the first in the area. Um, a lot of the buildings didn't. They were still, these were lit by gas um, gas lamps inside. State Hospital actually had a, they call it a, a natural gas generator. They would pour essentially gasoline to it, into it, and would convert it into a vapor and a gas, and they would pump it through the pipes, and it would come out, and uh, they would use that for the lighting. Um, East Main Street at Haskell Street, uh, former Yulman House. Yeah. Um, the, when the house was originally built, you can see it's a salt box. It's not a salt box anymore. They built the whole back up, made it under conventional house, and they put a big porch on the front. The sign, post, the bottom sign, gives a, a direction to the state hospital. How do you get to the state hospital? It's a mile away, and you'll see it's really just a, a, a cart path. You know, barely Failing enough room to get the cat down on. So, 1905 to 1918, we saw a lot of postcards. Um, this is the, the fire, Westboro Fire Department's first motorized fire truck. It's a 1914 Brockway, and it's a chemical wagon. I don't know how many, do you, many of you remember the old fire extinguishers, the big brass ones that you mm -hmm. have to flip upside down? And soda acid. Right, the soda acid. There was a glass bo bottle of acid inside, and then the water was mixed with usually baking soda. So when you flipped them over, it created a chemical reaction, created a gas, and it shot the water out the hose. It's exactly what this truck was. This was a chemical wagon. These here are the acid charges. There were two tanks, one here, one here. They each held about 50 gallons of water. When they would get to the fire, they would take one of these charges, tip it upside down, and these big wheels here, 
then spin them around to mix the acid with the water, and that would let them shoot the water about 10 to 15 feet. That's about it. But at least it was some water, and if they got there quick enough, they could each actually, you know, maybe stop a small fire from getting bigger. Jackson Steamer was in use um, until the World War II scrap drive, and the town uh, donated for the scrap drive. So we, lo we lost that. The um, interesting thing about the steam is the horses were kept, oh, probably about 300 feet down the street at the stable, down near where the Grange Hall is, or the old Grange Hall of the church. You know. Um, they would bring the horses up, hook them on to the, the uh, steamer, and pull it to the fire. The problem was, it was no good unless we had a, uh, just like a regular steam plant, we need fire and we needed steam. So they, the fire was already all set. All the wood was set in there and the kindling. And as soon as they'd get a call for a fire, they'd go in and light that. And there was a vent on the front. And as the horse was pulling this towards the fire, all that air would be rushing through and it would get that fire going. And hopefully by the time they got to the fire, they could hook up to a hydrant and this would let them shoot some water. Uh, and this would let it shoot up to 50, 60 feet. And the interesting thing about the steam is now, the South Pro Fire Department still has theirs. Um, Boston Fire Department was still using these, believe it or not, into the 1960s. After the big fires that they would have in the winter time, and all the ladders would be covered with ice, They'd bring this out and fire it up, and this would send hot water and steam, and they could throw out all the ladders and remove them. Um, they eventually ended up going to, you know, gasoline powered or uh, steam generators and, and pressure washers to do that. But, and they didn't help. <laughs> having, having fire trucks and having, having um, you know, steamers. When you had a fire this big, remember, this is about almost encompassing the same area as, De as um, Bay State Commons is right about now. That's how large this was. It burned everything from the center of town all the way down to the Keating Block. Keating, Keating Block was only three years old. They credit that, that building is credited with stopping the fire from destroying everything all the way down to the railroad tracks and beyond because it was all brick. It, did break out all the windows and, that, and it did catch fire inside, but that building did not burn down. One interesting side note, the quick lunch cart that used to sit in the, in the center of town, the wheels from that were removed when Daisy's Diner was built. Don't you remember Daisy's Diner? Mm -hmm. That's where the Korean restaurant is. Yeah. Um, those wagon wheels were in the basement of that building until the 1960s. And the beautiful Whitney House. The Whitney House burned in uh, 19, uh, 1906, 1907. Um, so the building wasn't in use very long. It started with a kerosene lantern in the pool room on the top floor that exploded. And when it exploded, one of, the, one of these large kerosene lanterns when it exploded, it lit the building on fire, and there was no way to save it. Westboro did not have an adequate water supply to fight fires until the uh, late 1940s. So the building and all of its uh, all of its stores were destroyed. The livery was saved in the back. Now another another great picture. Uh, again, probably around 1910, 1911, we've got the Westboro Community Band. There were four or five different bands in Westboro back then, and they all marched in the parades. I don't know who watched the parades, because everybody was in the parade. <laughs> um, but again, look at the men, all with the hats. Look at the ladies, all with the hats. Everybody's dressed up. Um, it's possible that this was at the, the dedication of the, um, uh, one of the memorials. Um, th this memorial here was actually moved in front of the uh, the police station, was made out of wood, and at some point, probably 20 years ago, 25 years ago, 
it was um, uh, it was destroyed. It was all wooded, rotted away, and they replaced it with what you see there now. Now here's the Westboro Coronet Band. Remember what I said about photo po photo postcards being like a snapshot of what's going on in Westboro that particular day and particular particular time. Um, if you were in a uh, in the Coronet Band, well now you have an opportunity to buy a postcard or a picture of you playing in the in the parade. The again photo studio upstairs with the, uh, the big glass skylight and the extra windows. Besides fires, we had train wrecks. Um, this train wreck occurred um, on the railroad tracks where they are now presently, between the railroad station and South Grove about a half a mile towards South Road. It happened on um, June 21st, 1907. The freight train was backing out of all the freight sidings, and at that time there were about six or seven different freight sidings. Because remember, everything was at that time was shipped um, by train. Um, not, you know, we didn't have the delivery trucks that we have now. This is how they went. And as the, there was some sort of communication error, and the high-speed passenger express from Boston to Worcester ran into the back of the freight train backing out. The steam engine rolled down the embankment, and the steam engine was on, on its first run, yeah. main run, and it was destroyed. Um, later was the, held one of the signalmen who was supposed to go farther down the track to stop the train as the train was back up. He failed to do his job. Here's the Keating block or the Odd Fellows block, built in 1910. So again, 1917, the building when it, when everything burned, it. Um, Hadn't been there long. It was a beautiful building. Again, built from Westboro bricks. The book has got, this building's got a great history. It was one of the post offices at Westboro. When they abandoned the post office block, uh, diagonally across from the town hall, they moved down here. The building was later purchased by Bay State Abrasives. And I'm told that many a Bay State employee um, bowled in there and uh, they turned it into an employee <coughs> recreation center. And when the, the town was in tough shape for elementary school classrooms, uh, Bay State um, gave the building to the town to use for classrooms until they built the Armstrong School. Bartlett Box Company, or the Whitney, originally the Whitney Box Company, then the Bartlett Box Company. Mr. Bartlett was the son-in-law of Mr. Whitney. So when he married his daughter, he got the business. Again, everything was shipped by train, so it had to be crated. So they, that's what their business was, making crates for everything that was manufactured in Westboro. And Westboro, again, it's a huge manufacturing town. Uh, we were one of the largest sleigh manufacturers in this it's part of the uh, country. Um, at, at times, the town was between all the different sleigh manufacturers. They were turning out between six and eight hundred sleighs a year, and a lot of the sleighs went as far away as um, the west coast. So uh, they were very, very busy. Again, if you wanted to go buy a fifty-pound bag of flour, you couldn't carry it home on your bike. So Fred Lamb, his grocery store, they would of course deliver it to your house, just like, uh, again, just like the hardware stores. I put this in because I think it's kind of funny. The Fisher Street Bridge is closed right now <laughs> because it's being rebuilt because the, all the car and truck traffic has destroyed it. Well, as you can see back then, we really didn't have a lot of car and truck traffic. It was primarily horse. And buggies, and that's what we had. 
it really does not look a lot different. Other than the bridge, it doesn't look a lot different than it does now. We talked about the sleigh manufacturing. Well, we, the Forbes sleigh shop right in there, they were probably the biggest uh, sleigh manufacturer in town. The building went, it was huge, the building went back about almost 300 feet. Get this. I love this guy, you know, he's got an attitude standing right here in the corner. I get the corner of the, uh, the Burnside building. And then, of course, this building is still here today. That's where Gerard's survey is. Yeah. And again, this is where the uh, A&P was. Okay. Uh, anybody know what the, other, the name of the other big grocery store downtown was? It's National. It's National, all right. Not everybody came from Woodville in here, I can see that. <laughs> you know what happened. Winch and Back's Candy Store. Winch and Back's Candy Store um, was in the car block, right at the corner of uh, Milk Street and West Main where uh, McIntyre Insurance is. And she used to make candy. This particular is a view is from a postcard and on the back, the lady that she wrote was said, we made 6,000 pounds of ribbon candy this week. That's what's in the window. It's all ribbon candy. This is on West Main Street, as you is uh, near the corner of Milk Street. Um, you notice, and it wasn't just candy. She, they sold kerosene lanterns. You'll see this is a there's like a toy dollhouse up there, toy house. Um, it wasn't just a candy store, but. Winch and Bax was known for their candy. All right. <laughs> Dwight Chapman and the Baby Doll Murder Mystery. I acquired these photos and images not two months ago. They came to me from an estate. The gentleman that originally owned them died, uh, ended up with a widow, widow passed away. Ended up being given to a friend. Friend didn't want him. Gave him to another friend. And he said, I know where these should go. And he actually brought them to me down at the Central House. So, um, and what's ironic is the Central House plays a role in this particular murder. So it's funny how things come around. So here's our victim, Dwight Chapman. Now, don't let the picture fool you. The Dwight was a, according to all accounts, was a bum, and as the descriptions of most of the people said, severely in need of a shave and a bath, uh, <laughs> dirty and torn clothing, arrogant, nasty. Nobody liked this guy. He lived at 40 South Street, which is the house, you have the central house, and you have Cottage Street as you go into the center of town where the credit union is now, and if you remember the old South Street Diner, that's where, um, 40, that's 40 South Street. So, he ended up, believe it or not, he was a, a tenant at, a, uh, at the rooming house. The owner of the rooming house died. She had no heirs, and he ended up with a rooming house and the barn and the workshop. Nobody can actually figure out whether he just appropriated it or whether it was left to him. The house was full of antiques, so he became a guy that didn't have anything to somebody that had money. He actually mortgaged the house, got a mortgage, and was known for walking around town with a roll of $100 bills. Again, you know, we're talking 1919 with a roll of $100 bills. The suspects, <laughs> Eleanor and Harry. <laughs> um, she was 20, he was 25. They came into town, no one knows how they got there. They went to the central house to get a room. There were no rooms available, so they were set next door. And next door, they, they got a room. From Mrs. Blake, that time she owned the rooming house. 
and they moved in. Sometime during the course of uh, while they were staying there, depending on which story, and there, there's as many stories about this murder as there are a lot of old stories about Westboro. Half of them are right, half of them are folklore, embellished on over the years. Um, he made rude comments and gestures to her, and she took offense to it, and Harry defended her. Well, come to find out that's not really what happened. Now, some of you who have lived in town a long period of time realize that Westboro was not different than a lot of other towns. Everybody got a nickname. Um, Squits, Fiffy, Rocco, Crowbar. Some of you know exactly who I'm talking about by mentioning these names. All right? Well, she became Baby Doll because she was so young and so pretty. And he, was, he became Sneaks. He looks sneaky. I'm not sure whether because he wore sneakers or whether he just liked to sneak around. This is where they rented their room. Again, the road to the right. That's uh, Cottage Street. The rooming house is in the front. Now, Mr. Chapman said, wow, if I can make some money running rooms here, why don't I move to the workshop then I could rent out my room and make even more money. So that's what he did. That's where he lived. In the workshop behind the house. He lived up on the upper floors. Now, how they found out about Mr. Chapman's demise is was right in here is where he used to keep his pigs and his chickens. And I have probably half a dozen different pictures of houses in Westboro. It's almost the same identical view. And I've got pictures of residents feeding their chickens and feeding their pigs in the same little pens like this. So it's pretty common. He would go over to the central house every day, pick up the bucket of garbage, bring it over and feed his pigs. Well, one of the, uh, one of the days, he didn't show up. And then the next day, he didn't show up. And then the third day, they had to buy another barrel over at the central house to put the garbage in. So they asked one of the, one of the uh, people at that came into the central hall. Geez, you know, we had to check into this a little bit. So he went up and got, went up to the police station, and we have a detective. It was assigned. He came down. They went inside. Oh, they went to the went to the side windows. He was upstairs. Went to the side windows. Couldn't see. He went around to the other side. They saw a leg sticking out of a bed covered with blankets. <laughs> they tried the door, the door was locked. So they forced the door and went in. They went right in through here. These photos that you're looking at are the original <coughs> crime scene photographs that were taken, taken by the state police at the time. Um, believed to be by the state police, I, I can't confirm that, but they are the official photographs. I'll, ex I'll explain to you how we think they ended up out of the police department's hands and out into the general public. So they walked in, the place was filthy, not much in it, dirt covered the floors. Inside a little small parlor with a fireplace. And you'll notice to the left there's a Dutch oven. Inside the Dutch oven, the police found the wallet of Mr. Chapman, empty, and they found the keys to his house. They went through to the next room. Here's, here's Detective Humphreys. I'll, let you, I'll just go with The furniture was of the cheapest variety and consisted of a bed, a pine bureau, a table, and a chair, all devoid of paint. The wood stove stained with blood, as were the rest of the articles. The bare wooden walls, the unswept floor, all contributed to the aspect of desolation. On the walls hung odds and ends of stable and household utensils of no value. <coughs> the clothes of the murdered man, frayed trousers, blood-stained coats, and ragged vests were strung here and there upon nails. There was an air rifle and two long barrel shotguns of the old muzzle loading variety with a box of percussion caps attached by a string to one of the butts. 
That was about all. This is from his narrative. And what's interesting is, according to some accounts, Detective Humphrey wasn't even there. <laughs> the police chief was there. And it's a, one of these, well, the police chief took the credit for it, even though Detective Humphrey went in there. Detective Humphrey claimed he was there, and you'll find out why as, as, we, as we go along. The kitchen. There were many people that said that, that uh, Mr. Chapman had no money. Even though he lived in the house, he had no money. Well, for somebody that didn't have any money, he had an awful big safe. Three foot by three foot safe in the kitchen. This is the stove. This head was, was covered with blood. The safe was never, they never were able to break into the safe. They broke the top of the hinges off. They broke the big dial off the front. They brought in a locksmith, unlocked the safe. And again, here's where the two stories are completely different. In, in the detective's report, they found $299 inside the safe. And that's a lot of money for 1919. In the, uh, in the other chief's, in the, fire, in the police chief's report, he said no money was found in the safe. <laughs> so there's a lot of different, different stories. And if you look at different history books of Westboro, you'll, you'll be surprised how much different one story is in one particular book versus in a different another book. Probably the most accurate book for the best research, and I'm not saying it because she's here, is Chris Allen. Some of this information in her book certainly clarifies the misinformation that was in some of these others, uh, some of the other books. So you notice some of the things hanging on the wall, as I said. Here's the top of the safe where they tried to drill through. As um, Sneak said in his confession, they just got tired and they weren't making any progress getting into the safe. They tried breaking in, they couldn't. And they tried uh, drilling through the top and they couldn't. So they left without getting into the safe. The murder room. The uh, rifles on the wall. He was uh, found in the bed, and um, hopefully this isn't too morbid for some of you. The, um, the stain in the bed is where they believe he was murdered. He was hit with a hammer, a uh, weapon of opportunity that um, the detective found. We'll get off of that scene for a minute here now. The, and here's where it gets a little, interesting, a little interesting here because Detective Humphrey became the police chief about 10 years later. And he wrote an article in 1929 for the Master Detective magazine about his exploits solving the baby doll murder. Whether he really did or not, we don't really know because again, there's two, almost, they're almost 180 degrees from each other about what really happened. The uh, one thing that does, and it is true, the police department did spectacular police work to catch them. The uh, sneaks and baby doll disappeared. She actually applied for work at the West Coast State Hospital as an orderly. The, um, the day after the murder, they disappeared. They took a train out of the center of town to the, uh, from the railroad station to Boston, but they left a trunk behind. And when the police opened up one of the trunks, they found out that they were heading towards, to Bangor. So they followed the train to Boston where they determined that, yes, they did indeed board a train for Maine. They went up to Maine. They couldn't find them. They had uh, <coughs> jumped around about back and forth up in Maine to two or three different towns, and they thought that they were up there, so they, they staked out the train station. And sneaks came back, they identified him. Now, this is, you gotta get a bit, this is pretty cool. 
you know, for, for but back then, uh, to for the police to stake out, know what this guy looked like, I'd be able to identify him, and they call him and said, to him, you know, uh, snakes. <laughs> Turned around, he gave up. <coughs> so then they said, where's baby doll? Well, she was working as a chambermaid over at the hotel. So they went over to the, the hotel, find her, and as they, they went into the room where she was working, she, uh, the, the police went in, as they approached her, she made a dash for her purse and almost pulled out her gun out of her purse and shot the police off. But they were able to tackle her before she was able to do that. So they arrested her and brought them both back and went to court. He took the blame. He said he murdered her. He, he was the murderer and she was innocent. She just helped. So she got a year in prison and was out in six months. Um, he got 20 years. Problem was, after 10 years, they let him out because he said that he didn't do it. He got a pardon from the governor. He said the baby doll did the actual murder <laughs> and she got away. And the only reason he's, he was telling the police what happened now is she took all his money and left. <laughs> now, Baby Doll wasn't done disrupting people's lives yet. Sneaks found out that he wasn't even really married to her because she was married to somebody else. <laughs> and there was a pending arrest warrant for her because she tried to kill her first husband. She shot him, stabbed him, and poured acid on him. You know, and he still lived. A tough guy. <laughs> So, and she wasn't done yet. She ended up, um, she floated around and around. They, could, they never brought her to trial. But she ended up back in Boston. And she hooked up with a Boston police officer who was married. And of course, she destroyed his marriage and his family. And they took off together. Well, they soon both did something that got them both arrested for morals charges. So he ended up going to jail. She ended up serving a little time in jail. He went back to his family and she took off. She ended up going out west and the last they saw her of Baby Doll, she was heading to Mexico. So she was, had the distinctive, now, now you gotta realize, this was a huge, huge thing going on in Westboro at the time. The newspapers from Providence all the way to, to Augusta, Maine, everybody was running these stories, the papers in Boston. They were, it was everywhere. It was great news for the, for the local newspapers. Um, so that's the, that's the story of the baby doll. It goes, it goes uh, a little bit more. I've got, a, I've got two articles here. One's the article that brought, was in the magazine, and I have the other one that Glenn Parker did which, which uh, he had put on Facebook about five years ago. So I'll leave them up here so afterwards if you want to take a look at them, you can read through some of it. But one of the interesting things, you got paid for writing stories for this <coughs> magazine. And the common thought is that maybe he embellished this just a little bit. Maybe he said I was the one that did all of this work when he really didn't. Because again, there's two different people claiming that they're the ones that went in. There's two different people claiming that they tracked her down. So, um, what's the real story? I don't think we'll ever know. No. Oh, I don't really know. No. So, goodbye baby doll. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, here's going to be some pictures that a lot of you are going to remember. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is Gerard Survey <laughs> building. We've got this little Art Deco building to the left. We've got, this is where the, uh, the gas station is, across from the fire station. Down here is the old arcade building. This is left over from the days when the railroad tracks came through the center of town and went up Summer Street. It was easy for them to unload the train cars right, right down here and distribute the products throughout the town. You know where this is? East Main Street at Route 9. Yeah. Oh. Looking at that, the Red Roof building is about where McDonald's is. Yeah. Yeah. It's about the same amount of traffic there today on East Main Street. <laughs> <laughs>
bus for rotary, and we got signs that say rotary traffic. Um, I like this this postcard. These postcards were taken prior to the 38 hurricane because it shows still shows the steeple of the old Baptist church that came down in the 38 hurricane. The building on the right, the arcade building, you'll see it's got a lunch sign on it. That's the Puritan lunch room, and probably not too many people remember that Puritan lunch room. They uh, it was kind of neat what they did. They made like a three by four inch card with little prices all the way around the outside, five cents, 10 cents, 25 cents. You'd buy the card, you'd go in, and then if you bought a sandwich for 25 cents, they'd punch out 25 cents on the card. Mm -hmm. You didn't have to go in there with any money, as long as you went in there with your card. That you Wasn't it called the Greasy Spoon? Pardon me? Wasn't it called the Greasy Spoon? There were a lot of names. No. Some of them, that's probably one of the nicer ones. <laughs> <laughs> you remember what they used to call Daisy's. <laughs> You know, and to, to you know, to show how you know Cam and Kite would clean their spatulas. <laughs> I kid you not. Anybody that was there. Yeah. Yes, you know. Yes. Where's the tower on Town Hall? I think the tower is. You're just seeing a little bit of it right here. I see. Again, Puritan lunchroom. Well, well known. The. Only sad thing about that was when they did the restoration of the building within the last year, the tile entranceway, beautiful brown and white tiles, um, almost looked like the small silver dollar tiles. It said pure and lunchroom. They tore that all up when they redid the entrance. And nobody knows what happened to it. They think it just got disposed of when they, uh, they restored the building actually to the way it was originally. Uh, but the pure lunchroom was put that in, you know, in the in the 20s. Uh, the post office. Uh, Forbes family built this along with, again, you know, tremendous amount of uh, other projects that didn't down. You'll see the freight cars to the right. Again, that's that's left over from the days when all the the freight tracks and all the railroad sidings were right along Brigham Street. Um, to the left. Behind that the little yellow car, it's a mobile gas station. Where it's the present side of the bank right now. One of my favorite photos. Yes. The Strand Movie Theater. How many people were there? Yes. Oh, yeah. How many yes. casserole dishes did you get? <laughs> what? How many casserole dishes did you get? Oh. <laughs> Every time you went to the Strand, you got a little coupon. If you got five of them, you could turn them in and get a casserole dish. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the site of, um, this was built on the site where the Forbes Slave Factory was. They tore that down, they built the Strand. And then they built, they tore this down and they built the apartment complex, which is there now, which they converted into condos about seven, eight years ago. And the name of that condo complex is called the Strand. And as a big strand movie poster right inside the lobby of the building. Right inside the front now, this is probably, I've got, I've got, again, thousands of pictures of Westbrook. I don't have any of the strand. I've got a little corner of a building. This is the only one that, that I've seen. And we now have a good picture of the theater. And how I acquired this is kind of neat. I heard that there was a gentleman out in Los Angeles that got into the MGM archives and had lots of ephemera. Well, he had one for Westbrook. This is a theater report. <coughs> if the MGM, if you showed MGM movies, they sent a, a kind of like a detective out to inspect your theater to see what, uh, what condition was in. You'll notice this was, the picture was taken in May of 1941, 19th Southern Street. There was 6,400 people in Westbrook back then. Um, they've been playing the movies for 20 years, built in 1921, 490 people. The big thing, the type of patronage, rural and mill. That's what they wanted to see. They wanted to see manufacturing, you know, mill towns, because that meant the people had money. The bottom part, balcony for color. Um, big, big deal down south because of, because of the segregation. Not so much up here. But um, kind of a commentary what was happening 
in the 40s, even still. So it's a great, great piece of uh, Westboro history um, that will eventually, as a, all of my entire collection, will end up at the library. I've already been working on that. It will all be donated to the library and nice archive boxes so they'll be safe. And if you'd like to go to the movie theater, you can go up to the Kiwanis uh, Bathing Beach with the bathhouses right on the shores of beautiful Lake Johnson. Um, and as long as the uh, state hospital wasn't pumping their sewage into the, into the lake that day, which, which they did. Um, in the back, you'll see one of the old, probably ice house, the ice houses of the, of the hospital. Part of the history of the state hospital was they used to get their drinking water from part of it from Lake Chauncey, part of it from, from wells dug around Lake Chauncey. Mm -hmm. The only problem was they also dumped the raw sewage from the hospital into the lake. So the water quality was horrible for the people to drink. And that's why the state hospital is the only facility in town that was serviced by MDC. They have their own MDC water system. Uh, it's now since been changed and they're, they're tying that whole complex into the town water system. Cunniff's Lodge. Cunniff's Lodge is right, right down, as you can see, right there, Chauncey and, and Lyman, um, right, right along the water. The, uh, the Cunniff's were <coughs> tremendous marketing people. They took out quarter page ads in all the New York newspapers and advertised about come to wonderful Westboro. And the people came by train. They were picked up at the train station and brought up to Cunniff's Lodge. Some of them drove, but they met spectacular advertising because you could come to Westboro and stay at our beautiful lodge. Right here we had boats for rent, we had swimming, um, we had Westboro Airport, which would take you for plane rides around Westboro. <laughs> We had all sorts of entertainment. It was a full service, almost like a resort. It really wasn't, but boy, the ads made it look pretty great. Um, and that eventually was uh, too far gone, and it was actually burned down by the fire department in a training session. So from 45 to 65, my last, my last group here. Um, it's not a, no longer a post office. It's now Dorothy Hickox Real Estate. And it's no longer the Puritan Lunch. It's now Angelo's Restaurant. Um, I'm sure many of you ate at Angelo's. A jukebox right near the front door. Um, quite the place. You'll see behind, there's the mobile gas station over here. This is great. This particular picture was in a was in a sleeve marked tenements. <coughs> so this is what somebody thought these were the tenements in Westboro. Uh, wouldn't they be shocked to know that this one now is now a multi-million dollar private residence of one, of one family. Um, this is a town hall. You don't know where you are. This is South Street. Um, this is the back of where Subway is. The building on the front to the left, Chinese Laundry. The building behind it was the, uh, the workshop of Emerson Rogers, town electrician. Now, I know some of you don't know these people. The, uh, the Westboro Rifle Team, Dick Gannon. Yeah. Uh, Wynn Spinney, the old fire chief. Uh, You recognize those people, don't you? Yeah. 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 Tufts. Tufts. Yeah. 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 Betty Tufts. Betty. All the things my father told me is never, never, you know, aggravate a woman that belongs to a rifle team. <laughs> so and you, we got two of them there. You know, you get uh, you get Ruth and you get Betty. Um, Dick Gannon ended up building a uh, on his. Uh, dealership on East Main Street. They ended up building a uh, shooting gallery inside that building on the left-hand side. He was a very avid sportsman. 
1947, we also had probably the most catastrophic fire to hit Westboro. The Hat Shop fire. Um, buildings were along Milk Street and along Phillips Street. Um, the, all the buildings on the other side of Milk Street, where the gas stations are now, they all burned. The, um, we have a 16 millimeter color movie that has not been digitized or restored yet. It will be hopefully by this time next year. And I'll be putting on a presentation on the history of the Westboro Fire Department. And it's about a 15 millimeter movie. And if any of you have seen, and it's in color, it's absolutely scary. If anybody has seen the old science fiction movies with giant ants are coming down the street and the women are holding their heads screaming, that's exactly what you see in this movie. The people are horrified because Paul Bloyce came out of Westboro Drug with his movie camera and shot from the front door of the store up through the rotary up Milk Street and all you can see is a wall of fire probably 40, 50 feet tall going from one side of the street to the other. They thought the entire town was going to be destroyed. Uh, in the end, about 28 buildings would, were, were burned. A bunch of them burned to the ground, houses, residences. Um, the fire station caught fire. Um, it was absolutely spectacular. We have that movie, and we have another three and a half minute movie taken by the Orlando family, one of the Orlando family members, that took an eight millimeter movie of essentially the same thing, but the, the, the Blois movie shows the fire right from the beginning. Um, it was incredible. They actually brought fire trucks in from Worcester to fight this fire. Um, the problem again, no water. There was insufficient water to reach up to the second floor. The building was full of excelsior and hay remnants. And if you remember how the, the, manuf the old man these manufacturing buildings were, down in the basement, they'd have the big steam engine and the big wide leather belts that come through the floor, and they'd hook up to pulleys up above, and they'd run the length of the building, and if they needed to operate a machine, they'd put a leather belt on that and run it. So everything was open. There were large openings from floor to floor to floor. So the fire that started on the first floor was through the roof in a matter of minutes. And it got so quick, the first fire truck tied into the hydrant in front of the building. Within a couple of minutes, they had to move the fire truck and they drove it away with the fire hose still connected to the hydrant because it, it just got out of control that fast. And we're lucky there's probably about 100 different spectacular photos of this fire. Um, the Telegram and Gazette actually chartered a plane and was flying over the fire taking pictures. Harold Thompson's Gulf Gas Station. Everybody knew the Thompsons, especially Harold, one of the nicest guys in town. Um, Dorothy Hickox was again in the back. One of the neat things about this picture is you see the bus? Anybody remember the bus line in West Road? Yeah. Cows for bus lines. Okay. They had six buses there. If you, Erickson's Garage on East Main Street, they got three bays. Um, they used to park two buses in each bay. And in, they ran from Westboro to Worcester and via North Grafton. In North Grafton, they would have a, they would meet another bus, and that bus would take you to Grafton Center, Upton, Hopedale, and Milford. So with six buses, they carried this this little route all the way around. <coughs> Pretty neat little uh, uh, operation. The Carlson family is still around, as you're aware. Carlson Press Metal on Fisher Street. All right, the town's getting bigger. Mm -hmm. After the war, so what do we got? We've got a new grocery store. 1957. This is the grand opening. Um, I, where Iandoli's was originally King's, for a short period of time, became Iandoli's. And one of the things I remember about Iandoli's is they had the best little snack bar. <laughs> they had great hot dogs and great crinkle cut french fries. <laughs> and we would go there after school. So that was your, again, the town is changing. And we have Dorothy and Foxes. But you see to the right, Waddell Chrysler Plymouth dealership. We had a car dealership right in the center of Westboro. 
Okay. Um, it was the Sunoco station. Afterwards, you know, it became Pat Sunoco. Yeah. Then it became White Hen. And then it became the 7-Eleven. And actually, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the owner of that building is here with us tonight. Isn't that right? <laughs> oh, I, obviously, it looks like they may have left. <laughs> no, there she is. There she is, back there. Yeah. You ever seen that particular view? The, the what else? Yeah, he has. Yeah. I remember it. Yeah. So, again, as the town grew and after the war, all these places started coming up. Dan and Motors. Um, Dan, we got um, what else? And Bay State Abrasive, the largest employer in the town at the time. Again, almost 2,000 people running three shifts at their, at their peak. Um, and what did they manufacture that was the most in demand? The steel snagger wheels that went to the steel industry that uh, supplied the steel for all the, all the uh, automotives, uh, manufacturing companies. Um, they made a lot of other products, but that was what they were, that was their bread and butter. Again, this complex ended up being become, oh, close to 10 or 15 buildings by the time it got done, not counting the buildings down at the Bay State Island. All those buildings are gone now except the two buildings down at the Bay State Island. Now, the Bay State Island is past downtown, if you go all the way down Brigham Street, all the way all around behind the, uh, the Boston Sports Club and continue down. Yeah. There's two of the buildings right down there on the edge of mm -hmm. the outskirts of Cedar Swamp. There's a dog tree. There's a dog tree. All right. Yeah. Who lives at 12 Beach Street? Anybody? Uh, this is what was here before you were there. <laughs> oh, wow. That's right. Westboro Tanning Corp. Mm -hmm. Before it was the Westboro Tanning Corp, it was actually, for a period of time, the locomobile factory. They actually manufactured locomobiles here in town. A uh, gentleman from G Jim Clapham from Northbrook, actually his father owned one of the vehicles that was manufactured in Westbrook. And before it was the locomobile factory, it was a bicycle factory, the Humber Bicycle Shop, bicycle factory. Um, they built it new um, in the uh, pre-1900. The problem with this building was the the hides that were left behind when they decided when the building became vacant. Two stories about this building. When the building became vacant, they were, they were not allowed to tear it down. Because of the hides, there was a concern of anthrax, so the building had to be burned, along with all the hides that were inside. That's the height, the present site now, uh, 12A and 12B Beach Street, the um, senior housing. Another great story about this was when World War II hit, all the men that were in here that either enlisted or got drafted, with no exceptions, their positions were taken by their wives. They all came in and worked in the tannery. And the owner of the tannery published a monthly newsletter and sent it out to every one of the soldiers that used to work in the tannery. It was called Tannery Trimmings. And it was a monthly chronicle of what was happening in the war around the world, plus what was happening in Westboro whether there was a fire. Um, <coughs> this guy was shot down over the Pacific, presumed, you know, missing, presumed dead. This guy was injured, was injured at this particular battle. And he sent those out to every one of his former employees, no matter where they were in the world during the war. We have a complete collection of all of them, from the beginning of the war to the end. And those, I, I was on the detail when we had to burn the building. I found those. I said, and they were in a folder in a file cabinet. I said, you know, he's probably ought to be saved. So I grabbed them and I've had, had them for almost 50 years. So, again, up to the library. Take it, Lazarus. The, uh, the high school in the 50s, the Forbes family, Mrs. Forbes especially, hated the look of a town with debris and trash. After the, after the uh, Whitney House burned for many years, it was, it was, the rubble was there. She didn't like it. She went in, cleaned it up. They built a high school, and they gave it to the town. They did the same thing at the hatch of the um, National Straw Works fire on East Main Street. Um, they cleaned up that old area. They built football fields, baseball fields. They built the Forbes Community House. They gave that to the town. The uh, Forbes family 
did a tremendous amount of stuff for Westbrook. Now, all right, you're going to know some of these people. <laughs> How times have changed. There's only a 39 people in the class of 55. <laughs> How many do you recognize? Right. You know, Bob Walker from Village Lumber. Yeah. Hal Walker from the Fire Department. Charles Boyer. Charles Boyer. Yeah. Um, Mary Lou Diamond now. So, a good. Good bunch of West Brom graduates, huh? <laughs> go ahead. You can go ahead and stand up and take your picture. It's gonna be it's gonna be some relevant, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So I've got probably uh, 30 or 40 of these, all different years, that uh, I've acquired over the years. And even the earlier ones where they didn't do pictures like this, they did individual pictures, pictures from the 20s and uh, 30s. The town, again, was growing, so what did we get? We got a first, uh, first big, huge clothing store, Brzezewski's. I don't know if any of you remember that, the corner of Route 9 and um, Brzezewski's. They sold um, men's and women's clothing. It was a huge building, as you can see. But to the right, where Burger King is, or was, until they turned down, Langoni Snack Bar. Okay? They also had great hot dogs and french fries. <laughs> okay? And there was another Langoni's in town at the corner of Milk Street and Route 9. It's where Gerardo's Bakery is. For a period of time, that was also a Langoni's. Now, their stuff wasn't that great. Because they used to have an old guy in there that would drool all the time. you just lose your appetite, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go in there. Though. So, yes, yeah. So, here's what was there before Langoni's, the former Tavern. So we moved the town to the side of the Forbes Chavage, which was too important. This building um, dates from 1699. Wow. One of the oldest buildings, one of the oldest stops on the turnpike. And we had to save the building. Oh, but yeah. nobody had a plan what to do with it. <laughs> but we just had to save it. So we jacked it up, and we spent all the effort and time, and we moved it down on the shores of wonderful, near the shores of wonderful Lake Chauncey. <laughs> and it sat until somebody tried to burn it. They put it out, and then they tried to burn it again. <laughs> and they put it out, and the third time they succeeded. Aww. So the building was destroyed. But it was a good effort. It, unfortunately, there was no place to put it, and there was no plan. Um, I think the, the idea was, let's just save it before it gets torn down. <laughs> Um, one of the one of the other issues we needed commercial space in town. We had all these people and there was people were demanding commercial space. We needed space for realtors. We needed spaces for doctors. We needed spaces for all these other businesses. Well, Mr. O'Neill said this looks like a great building, and I'm sure with a coat of paint, a couple of new windows, I can make it look something beautiful. <laughs> And that's what he did. Yes. He converted it into the professional building. The building is still standing today. It's still in use. <laughs> right, right across from, right beside the Dairy Queen. <laughs> we didn't have big box hardware stores either back then. We had uh, small independent hardware stores. And you were usually very loyal to a particular store. Sure. You know, if you, it's just like a gas station. You always went to the Shell station. You never went to the mobile. You always drove a Chevy. You never drove a Ford. Same thing. Um, 
Swan Hardware was known for their paints and their wallpaper. They were a full line hardware store too, but if you needed paints or wallpaper, that's where you went. You went to Swan's. You'll notice in the back, you can just see a little bit of it, Daisy's Diner. You can see the, the DNAI there uh, with the mobile station still there in the 50s. Again, if you didn't want, if you, didn't, if you weren't looking for paint, and you weren't looking for uh, wallpaper, you went here. Yeah. Remember Tony? Yeah. Tony would be right inside the front door, usually sitting in the chair, right by the cash register. Uh, this is on Milk Street. At the Grove Street is just to your right. The building is still there. All the, uh, the slates been removed the front, it's been refaced with, with wood. And uh, for a while it was an attorney's office. The, um, yeah, so moves off. One of the things I remember about modern hardware is you see underneath where the modern hardware sporting goods? If you wanted to go fish up at the reservoir and you needed something to hold your worms or you needed a fishing rod, I can remember going in there and getting the little red and white plastic floats yep. yeah. and we'd go up to the reservoir. Well, that's what he had. He had a big fishing section. The other thing that he had, which the other stores didn't have, he sold model kits. It was the only store that sold that. So in later years, the Circle store did. But and back then, the uh, modern hardware was a place to go. They were known for having an extensive hardware collection and plumbing and pipes, whatever you needed. Black pipe, iron pipe, whatever you needed, they had it there. All right, you remember the first train accident where I told you it was down about about half a mile down from the train station. This is almost the same identical area, 1964. This made national headlines <coughs> because these box cars were filled with wheat that was scheduled to go to Russia. Russia was having a famine at the time in 64, and there was outrage in this country by a lot of people that said, why should we be helping a country that has um, threatened to blow us off the face of the earth with all their nuclear weapons. Um, so the FBI came in, um, they uh, did extensive work, it was uh, determined that it was just a faulty wheel on one of the cars, it was no, wasn't, wasn't a terrorism or a sabotage as most people thought. And up until a few years ago there was still wheat growing along the railroad tracks. And I've got a great picture. I don't know if you remember Johnny Farquhar from town. Yeah. I have a picture of Johnny Farquhar on top of one of the box guys getting yelled at. <laughs> and that picture ran in the paper. These, these, some of these photos here came from the Telegram and Gazette archives. That's where a lot of my other photos came. If you remember the Telegram and Gazette office was downtown. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they would post the pictures on a bulletin board out on the front of the window. So if, if you want to go in, you can grab the picture. Well, I always uh, if you remember. Uh, Jan Curley, Jan Curley Town, she became. Um, she, was a, she would save me all the photos, instead of them throwing them out, she'd throw them in a box and give them to me. So I have a lot of pictures from, from this area of the town. All right, we're going to look at a couple things here, and I'll go through real quick. Little mini farms, Joe Antonio's package store. This is the mobile gas station. Dorothy Hickox's building. The uh, Chrysler Plymouth dealership, which is, you know, you get now the 7 Eleven. It's no longer the um, Gulf Station, now it's a Phillips 66. Modern Hardware, Grange Hall, and we have the Rexall. The Golden Swive and Dime, and across the street diagonally was Bill Ford's newsroom. Yes. Now, you must, if anybody went into either one of those stores, you remember the Day Sisters. Yeah. The Day Sisters, the Day Sisters, one worked at Golden's, one worked at the newsroom. They lived up uh, on the corner of Route 9 at Otis Street, uh, in the farmhouse, uh, right where Fountain Plaza is right now, right in the corner. And their father was actually a merchant in Westboro. And he sold Edison phonograph players. 
uh, in the 1890s. So then we come around the corner, of the West Road Package Store is still there, the town shop, Lowe's Variety, and right in here, the Circle Store. Freddie Farron? Yeah. Freddie and Bunny Farron? <coughs> so, not a, you know, the buildings are the same, the, the, the uh, Lord's Men's Shop, all of that stuff. Now. Oh my God. <laughs> 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 so, all right. Here's one of the day girls. Yeah. Uh, Bill Ford and Jim, of course. Now, this is a. I want to tell you something very important. There's a back room here. There's a back room here, and there was a back room at the Westboro Drug Company. <laughs> and ninety percent of the decisions that were made by the movers and shakers in this town were made in those three back rooms, believe me. The selectmen, the politicians, the business owners was all discussed in Lowe's it was discussed over you know, a can of beer. Um, but it's absolutely true. Down here you'll notice there's a set of stairs. Yep. Oh, yeah. That goes down to Nick's coffee shop. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You go down the bottom of the stairs, there's a great big Coke cooler. You lift it open, all the Coke bottles are in there. And a half a dozen booths in there, three in the left, three on the right. Small counter. And you know what they had that was really good? Hot dogs and French fries. <laughs> God, love the hot dogs. And Nick, Nick there behind the counter. Now, this is just a basement. There's not a window in there, there's not a door. You're just going down these stairs. And it's like going into a cell. But it was really a pretty cool place. I can remember going, the, going in there when I was in uh, junior high. <laughs> Our last slide shows Westboro in 1965. Um, not a lot different than it is today. The, um, the, the, the two buildings over here, they're gone. These, this was destroyed in the fire. Um, and the other building was torn down. The, the old post office box and, and the new uh, apartment building was built. But that's essentially our town. But you notice, not very many cars going on the road right now. There's nobody, there's nobody wearing out their horn going around the road right now. And I've, I've heard that actually happen. So. And that, ladies and gentlemen, that, that uh, ends my program. If you got any questions, come on up. I'm going to put both of these out. If you want to read a little more about the, the baby doll, you can come up and you can take a look at these. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.